Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, I'm uh, very honored to be here and uh, to speak to you, uh, to this magnificent uh, audience, about Europe. I mean, Europe is far away. Uh, I've learned that uh, California is looking to the other side of uh, the Pacific Ocean, uh, to Asia, and of course, is uh, for the future of all of us uh, a very important perspective. But on the other side, uh, Europe uh, is... Uh, and this is uh, my view, uh, will be crucial for the future of the West. And uh, the West means, at the end, the transatlantic relations. It means the United States and Europe. And of course, uh, there are new challenges, uh, rising powers in the Pacific. But on the other side, uh, looking to uh, the major challenges uh, to the Middle East, to Russia, and uh, to the question of uh, a new world order, uh, from my view, it will be very important whether the West will have a future or not. And therefore, Europe is far away, but uh, maybe uh, for one hour I will take you on a, a trip back uh, to the old Europe, uh, which is uh, definitely old on the one hand, but in a, in a very revolutionary transitional process at the moment. Revolutionary, because uh, it's hard to understand why revolutionary, because uh, if you read the papers, you read that uh, lack of growth, uh, there's a, a hesitation on transformation and adjustments uh, to globalization. But if you look back, uh, you, you cannot understand Europe without the European history. Europe was a d divided continent uh, during the Cold War. And the Cold War started at the end of the Second World War. And the Second World War was a result of the European system of states, of the so-called European system of balance of powers. And the balance of powers in the history of Europe uh, didn't work uh, uh, very well. Uh, definitely since the French Revolution, it uh, worked uh, in a very insufficient way because after the French Revolution, nationalism was the driving force in Europe. And this driving force of nationalism, this was not only present in Germany, but at the end in Germany, this was a driving force which led to the First World War and then to the Second World War and almost to the self-destruction of my country. And as a result, Europe was divided between two superpowers, non-European superpowers, the United States in the West and the Soviet Union in the East. But why statesmen at that time made two, and I would be very happy we would have a similar strategic thinking nowadays, why statesmen at that time made two strategic decisions which defined the world after 1945. First of all, thanks uh, to the wisdom of the American leadership at that time that America decided to stay in Europe and uh, stay committed uh, with troops in Europe. So this uh, defended not only liberty in the Western part, but opened also a perspective for a new approach to reorganize the European state system. And the second uh, strategic uh, decision was done mostly by French statements, uh, Schumann and Monet, uh, which uh, analyzed very carefully the European tragedy and uh, came to the idea, and this is very important to understand uh, for, an American, uh, uh, for an American auditorium, came to the idea that Europe must integrate the interests of the different states. So they developed, not uh, based on economy, but based on uh, uh, a new principle of uh, uh, state order in Western Europe, and this means not the confrontation of the interests of sovereign states, but the integration step by step, starting with the economic interests. Because the economy was a driving force uh, for nationalism and drove uh, 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 European sovereign states, especially France and Germany, uh, into a, a conflict, into a permanent uh, conflict. So this was the very beginning, this idea to create a new European order which will overcome the sovereignty of independent sovereign states and pool sovereignty where there is a need for it 
so that a permanent peace could be achieved in Europe. And if we look back, we must say that both decisions to stay in, the, uh, in Europe with armed forces and stay fully committed on the behalf of the United States and the decision of the Europeans, the Western Europeans, especially of uh, France and Germany, to move forward by forming a common market and then step by step creating common institutions. This is one of the great success stories uh, of the 20th century. And when the wall came down in 1989, I mean, there was, there was always, uh, I mean, the reaction of uh, almost all, almost, not all, Yugoslavia was different. But uh, of almost all the Eastern and Central European countries was the same. They wanted uh, uh, two things. To join NATO, to get the security guarantee by the United States and Western Europe, and to join the EU and get the guarantee for development. And therefore, from the very beginning, Europe was not only founded as a core of uh, some states, Germany, France, Italy, Benelux, but the intention, the real soul of this process was to create a Europe in its, a whole Europe. So one principle, not two principles. In some of the debates for an American auditorium, let me, uh, let me, let me make this remark. Some of the debates you had in the 1820s with President uh, John Quincy Adams at that time, or uh, during the Civil War, where there should be two or three United States at the end on the North American continent. This debate is now a very serious debate, more than uh, almost 100 years, uh, uh, 200 years later. Um, in Europe. And I will come back to this uh, uh, question later on. When I said that Europe is in a revolutionary process, so, so you will ask where, where, where is the European revolution? We don't see revolutionaries. We, maybe in France we see now some, some <laughs> activities on the street. Um, but where is the revolution? I will show you one. For an American, it, 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 you will ask, uh, where's the revolution? We had, you had your dollar since uh, the founding of the United States from coast to coast. But many of you went to Europe in the old days, all two to four hundred kilometers sometimes every hundred kilometers. You had to change the currency. Currency, what is currency? Currency is money, of course. But what reflects currency? Currency reflects an element of serenity because currency is based on a political decision of a power which controls the territory. This is currency. So it has not only an exchange element in the economy, which is the everyday use of currency, but we can trust on it because it's the, the guarantor is a very powerful one. A sovereign state with its institutions which guarantees that this is not only printed colorful paper, but this is a, really, I mean, a guaranteed um, uh, worth uh, so uh, uh, that it's currency. And to pull this element, this core element of sovereignty, is a revolutionary step. It never took place after Diocletian in Europe, and Diocletian was uh, one of the Roman emperors uh, uh, after Christ. So this is an important step forward, and especially my generation. When I look back, I'm born in 48, grown up during the Cold War, grown up in West Germany. I lived for 32 years in Frankfurt. So my reality was that there are borders, there are sovereign states, 
and there is one very important border which divided my country and which divided uh, Europe. And this was uh, 90 to 100 kilometers east of Frankfurt, the so-called Fulda Gap. And behind that, there was a complete other new reality. This has completely changed. We have now the European currency. We have the European Union with its institutions. We have the European court. We have the common market. And uh, we have the enlargement process. And enlargement now, Europe, the European Union has opened its doors and uh, 10 new member states from Central Europe and uh, Southeastern Europe joined the European Union. From a union of 15 member states, we have now a union of 25. And to explain it to, a, to an American, uh, to an American uh, auditorium, to understand, because sometimes Americans completely underestimate this challenge. It's not very popular, this enlargement. And what, following very closely your immigration debate nowadays, you may imagine which debate you would have in California and the rest of the United States if there would be the serious challenge that Mexico and the Central American states should join the European Union. I mean, imagine that. You, I mean, if we, we could play such a, a civil war game and uh, create the slogans and uh, position the different parties and people. Uh, I mean, it would be a, a, a tremendous challenge. So it's not one to one because the situation in Europe is different. But to understand it from an American perspective, I think it's a very good example uh, to, to really uh, un understand and digest the challenge. So, but on the other side, enlargement is one of the very rare win-win situations uh, in uh, modern history. I remember very well when we had Franco and Salazar in uh, Spain and uh, Portugal, when we had uh, the military dictatorship in Greece. I remember very well that Ireland for hundreds of years was uh, 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 exporting immigrants, poor Irish people who tried to escape poverty and to survive in the United States. Millions of Irish people came to the United States. And nowadays, Ireland is per capita the second richest country in the European Union. Only Luxembourg has a higher per capita income. <laughs> it's unbelievable. And this is a result of the enlargement process. If you go to Spain, to Portugal, to Greece, all of them are importing workforce. All of them, including Ireland. Nowadays, if you walk through uh, the streets of Dublin, you will see a lot of uh, immigrants coming from outside, from uh, Lithuania, from Poland, uh, from France, uh, from the Mediterranean, uh, uh, Arabs, whatever. If you know the Irish history, it's a real miracle. And the same with uh, Spain, Greece, and Portugal. Nobody could believe that this is a serious threat, that there will be a military dictatorship again nowadays. Thanks to NATO and thanks to EU integration. So what we see, and this is not a gift, it would be a complete misunderstanding, investing in the infrastructure, investing in development, if you look to the trade figures between Germany and the Mediterranean, or Germany nowadays and Poland and other new member states, you will see it's a tremendous business. It's investment of, in new markets, and not only for Germany, for all of the northern European and high industrialized countries, and by the way, for some American companies too. You are invited, of course. This is not uh, an exclusive uh, uh, engagement of the European Union. These are investments, and the return of investments are very high. Nevertheless, it means also new competition. When the wall came down, a new economic geography was created, not only a, a new um, a political geography. So this is another form of peaceful revolution in, Ro in Europe. And people are used to live uh, in a certain framework which is called national states or nation states. And this is changing now. So in Europe, to overcome the legacy 
of the period of nationalism is one of the major challenges we have nowadays. And uh, the European Union is uh, a quite a revolutionary answer to that. We have a lot of problems, and I will talk about these problems. But before, I will underline the great success story of the European Union. Nowadays, it's almost impossible to think in terms of an armed conflict between European nations. It's, it's almost impossible, or it's impossible. Because our institutions, our interests, also our civil societies have reached a level of integration where this is definitely excluded. And everybody who knows European history knows that Europe was always the continent of wars. By the way, this was one of the driving experiences for the founding fathers of the American Constitution to avoid uh, a similar mess than uh, they have seen now at that time in Europe. And this was before the big world wars started uh, with the beginning of the 20th century. Peace is crucial in Europe. And to achieve peace is, I think, one of the biggest positive results the European integration process has definitely managed. The alternative, and uh, you must understand that uh, I'm not talking about, uh, I mean, a nice Sunday speech. All of you will remember the early 90s, when Yugoslavia collapsed. I will never forget at that time. It was very painful for me because of someone born after the war and knowing uh, very well the painful history of my own country. I was grown up with two basic convictions. Never again war and never again in Holocaust a genocide. And it seemed to be, over decades, very easy to combine that as a young German. And then, with the collapse of Yugoslavia, suddenly these two basic principles came in a very bitter conflict. And this conflict was that we had to rethink our position with a position, no more war. This could not lead to a situation where you were watching, that women were mass raped, that there was mass murder, ethnic cleansing, and uh, terrible crimes happened. This was the situation at that time in Yugoslavia. And these are not primitive tribes in the Balkans. This challenge is a typical European challenge. If you do not contain, or much more better, overcome the challenge of nationalism. And once again, it was the leadership of the United States, the leadership of uh, the government of President Clinton at the end, which led us then to an armed intervention. It was a very bitter debate in Germany. It was a very bitter debate for my party, but not only for my party and a very bitter decision for myself, but at the end we had to learn that uh, human rights, if there is no other alternative, must be defended. And if there is no other alternative, then it must be done also by the use of arms. But knowing this, it was also quite clear that with the armed intervention, the problems couldn't be solved. Ethnic lensing, must be stopped and could be stopped by an armed intervention. But the second, uh, the second challenge, maybe much more important, was to open a perspective for the whole region. And once again, it was these, uh, these double structure, open for NATO and open for the EU. So another important, uh, another important challenge was the enlargement now in the Balkans. And what we can learn here, ladies and gentlemen, is that especially, I mean, uh, 
the experience of, uh, of uh, this these revival of a, a very inhumane and uh, terrible nationalism in uh, the Balkan Wars uh, in the 90s is the fact that uh, at the end Europe cannot live in peace with two principles, with two different political systems. The Europe of the integration, overcoming nationalism in the nationalistic period, cannot develop peacefully, cannot flourish when there is on the eastern or southeastern border another Europe which follows a completely different principle, the old principle of nationalism, nationalistic hate and confrontation. So we had to open up. We started with the stability pact. We moved forward with uh, offering long-term integration. Slovenia, a former Yugoslavian state, is now member of the European Union. Croatia has opened the negotiations. Of course, in Macedonia is also moving forward. Serbia is a tragedy. And the Serbs must uh, make up their mind what they want. More, move forward into an acceleration of their decline or hand over the two major war criminals to The Hague and move forward to the integration into EU and NATO. But before I left uh, the Foreign Office, one year before, I had an invitation as a guest of honor from other foreign ministers. The invitation came from the Albanian foreign minister. There was a meeting, the Albanian foreign minister, the foreign minister of Macedonia, the foreign minister of Croatia, the foreign minister of Serbia, and the foreign minister also a Serb from uh, Bosnia-Herzegovina. Again one year before, it wouldn't have been impossible that these people would have met for peaceful discussions. Completely impossible. Thanks to the perspective to be integrated into the West, it means NATO and European Union. And without these perspective, these nations will fall back in the old, old tradition of national hatred and we will see the same problems again. So the European Union definitely is a factor of peace and stability in Europe. But nowadays the challenge is, I mean, history is challenge number one for Europeans. Challenge number two is our neighborhood. Where Europe ends, where Europe starts, this is still an open discussion. I mean, for Americans it's easier, from coast to coast. <laughs> they have some problems now in the south. In the north, the polar bears, they will stay there. <laughs> but uh, you also have some challenges following your debate. But in Europe, the situation is much more complicated. In the north, of course, we have the polar bears too. The North Atlantic and the Arctic Circle, there is our national border. In the west, as long as America will not uh, request a membership in the European Union, it will be. <laughs> and I don't, don't expect that. It will be the Atlantic Ocean. In the south, it will be the Mediterranean. But where in the East? Since the very beginning, in ancient times, the definition of Europe created always a problem in the East. De Gaulle had the great idea, because he was a great statesman, he defined Europe from the Atlantic to the Ural Mountains. Well, what does it mean that Europe should split Russia? I mean, the Ural Mountains are more or less exactly, I mean, uh, in the middle of Russia. And I don't believe that the Russians will enjoy it if we would say, well, this is Europe, there is a border, the rest is Asia, forget about it. This wouldn't be a good idea. And Russia, Russia is uh, strongly, strongly rooted in Europe. 
And Russia, with the majority of uh, uh, her population, is, uh, uh, looks to the West, to Europe. But Russia is a dimension by itself, as it's the United States. Russia is a whole continent, it's known culture. Once again, with close links to Europe, but it's not Europe. It's not European size. But there are other important questions. What about Belarus? What about Ukraine? What about Moldova? Take, for example, the Ukraine. I mean, this was one of the major challenges we had two years ago in December, the crisis after the frauded elections in the Ukraine. It was quite clear that uh, it's not only about whether it's acceptable to have frauded elections. But behind that was another question. Whether the Europeans will accept that Russia is going back to the old imperial thinking of the zone of influence. If this would have been successful, ladies and gentlemen, we would have, we would have had a completely different strategic situation on the eastern borders of the European Union. So, on the Maidan in Kiev, the issue was not only about free and fair elections, but the issue was also about whether a new Russia and a new Europe can cooperate on the principles of international law and of the core element that uh, elections must be free and fair as the basic, as the basic decision um, of uh, self-determination. So self-determination against zone of influence, imperial thinking against democracy. And this still is a major element in the relations between Europe and Russia. We shouldn't forget that. And therefore, I mean, it's not so easy to say, offer the Ukrainians that they should join EU. Because on the other side, many people in the Ukraine are also looking to the East. But at least we must focus on the, on, on, on the challenge that the decision must be an Ukrainian decision, free and fair, based on the majority rule. And Europe must keep its door open, not more and not less. What the consequences will be in the future, I can't tell you nowadays. And the same with Belarus, the same with Moldova. We should be very careful, because if we would accept some sort of shady Europe, uh, shadow Europe, between Russia and uh, the European Union, this will be always a source of terrible trouble for everybody. And therefore, I think uh, uh, this should be considered in our relations to Russia. But then, a democratic, a modernized Russia, and this will be still a world power, I think Europe has any interest to improve strategic relations, maybe one day open borders, whatever. So there could be a really, I mean, close cooperation. And I think, uh, on the one hand, Russia is too big and too important that we can isolate Russia. This would be f a foolish policy. But on the other hand, we shouldn't uh, be silent when we have to speak out because things are going wrong or maybe are going terribly wrong, then we have to criticize it. And uh, that's, I think, a very important approach. Friends must be always candid. Polite, but candid. We should understand the problems, but we should not uh, turn away or be silent uh, when uh, there is a need of, uh, of an open word and uh, of criticism. Criticism helps many times, not only in the direction to Russia, sometimes also to much more closer friends. Let me tell you this experience. <laughs> so there we are. Russia is not a possible candidate for the European Union. But there is another, Your Excellency, another challenge. And this is in the southwest, uh, southeast. It's Turkey. 
It is a very complicated challenge. If you would have asked me before 9-11 whether I will be in favor of uh, accession of Turkey into the European Union, I would have said, yes, 51%, I'm in favor of 50, 49, not. Because there are some serious, really serious problems. But after 9-11, I've changed my position very much. Because 9-11 made quite clear where the major threat for Europe in the 21st century will be. 9-11 happened in the United States. But the source of these terroristic attack on the people and the government of the United States, it's based in the Middle East. And this is our direct regional neighborhood as Europeans. Theoretically, you as the US, the United States have the option to disengage and go back to the Western Hemisphere. You won't do that, but theoretically you have this option. Europe has nothing like that because geopolitics matters and we are direct regional neighbor. So what, what does it, uh, uh, these facts explain about Turkey? I mean, why was Turkey and why is Turkey member of NATO? And why is Turkey member of the European, the Council of Europe? Because Turkey was crucial to defend the southern flank of NATO during the Cold War against the Soviet Union. At that time, Turkey was a marginal theater. Germany was the central theater. But if my anal analysis is correct, that peace and stability for Europe will be defined in the Eastern Mediterranean and the Middle East, then Turkey moves forward into the center stage, whether we like it or not. And then we must understand that the price to tell Turkey for 43 years, and this was done by conservatives as social democrats, but it started with conservatives, with a Christian democrat. He was a secretary of, uh, no, state secretary uh, in the period of Konrad Adenauer, the first uh, uh, president of the commission, Walter Halbstein. He was not a Green, he was not a social democrat, he was a Christian democrat, who gave a tremendous important speech 43 years ago, after the signing of uh, the association agreement within a few months in Athens and in Ankara. And he gave a speech in Ankara where he said, one day you will be member of the European Union. And since then, this uh, promise uh, was again and again, I mean, made uh, to Turkey. And it would be foolish, ladies and gentlemen, if we would nowadays say to the Turks, when they have started in a substantial way to transform and to move forward to European standards, sorry folks, we told you you can join as long we, we, we were serious that you will never make it, but now you are on the road, we are sure you can make it, so we, we didn't tell the truth. The price would be tremendously high. Consider the present situation. If we in October, and I'm proud about that, that this was the last position, where, uh, the last decision uh, to which I contributed as a German foreign minister before, before leaving the office. If, we would have, if the U European Union would have decided last October to say no to the opening of the negotiations, accession negotiations with Turkey. And now, with a great strategy in Iraq, Iran, Hamas and Turkey frustrated, pushed back. Where would we be? This would be a great, great mess, very irresponsible and short-sighted. Unfortunately, the other part of the picture is that nowadays in the European Union we have the most severe crisis since the founding of the Union because it was quite clear enlargement without deepening and without strengthening the institutions will not really work. 
So the French vote about the Constitution was a major blow, a major setback for the European Union. And together, once again, the French no, the Dutch no, no Constitution, Turkey humiliated, pushed back, Iraq, Iran, the Middle East, radicalization. Where would we end? Unfortunately, in the present leaderships, it, uh, they are under severe pressure of the public opinion. Yes, it's not popular. Enlargement is not popular. And especially, I mean, looking to the French and uh, Dutch decisions, it was mostly about enlargement. It's not popular. And once again, I mean, imagine what it would mean in the United States to sell such an agenda to the American people. It wouldn't be very popular. But on the other side, I mean, history matters and our strategic interests, they will matter. And uh, we have clear, clear options. We can say, okay, we are going back again to the European kindergarten. We are not any longer interested in our strategic interests. Europe cannot play a role outside. We have to figure out inside what we can do, whether we will elect it or not, or whatever. We can do that. But this kindergarten will not last for very long because we live in very interested, in very interesting times, as the Chinese proverb say, says, and uh, especially in our neighborhood. So there we are, and the third challenge is uh, globalization. And maybe it's one of the tragedies that uh, people in Europe are overstressed by change. You won't believe it. But go to East Germany, talk to the people. What they have, I mean, they had such a tremendous amount of change, which is not realized from outside, because there were no shootings, no barricades. Everything happened in, in, in a very decent, conservative way. But talk to the people. I mean, they have changed tremendously. And nowadays, we have these two parallel processes of Europeanization and globalization. The same challenges you have. Where are the jobs gone? This is an important question. And uh, we have the parallel debate in Europe as you have it now in the United States too. And this is one of the factors the European Union is blamed for. That Europe is the agent of globalization and not the protection. So there we are in a very, very shaky situation and Europe uh, at the moment is not uh, in its best uh, condition. But I'm sure that uh, history will uh, teach the Europeans that they have to move forward. If I look uh, now into the Pacific region, I mean, uh, what we see is the, emer the emergence of super economies. Even the American economy one day in the 21st century will be a small economy compared to the super economies, which is, are now emerging, India, China. And uh, I don't believe uh, that uh, it's a good idea that we should try to create a new world order on a global balance of power system. I think if you look to the effects, will we have wars about oil? in a completely integrated world economy. So America will defend their, their oil uh, uh, demands and resources, and the Chinese will have a shortage. This would have been a tremendous consequence for the American economy, for the world economy, for the global economy. I mean, seven million, uh, seven billion people with uh, more than 190 states, they cannot be organized in a system of balance of power or as coalition of the willing. I don't buy that. My imagination is not big enough to understand how this should work. If we are serious about these developments, I mean, our destiny will be that we will be forced to cooperation, whether we like it or not. We need cooperation to manage 
the global problems, not only security problems, the environmental problems. Take only the energy resources. I mean, for seven billion and more people, we need cooperation. Especially, I mean, the experiences of 1929, it shouldn't be forgotten. Markets at the end, there must be a structure which can avoid extreme disbalances of markets, otherwise markets will implode. And this is the challenge for a wise strategic policy. But I'm not very optimistic, ladies and gentlemen. I can't believe that uh, in the 21st century the Europeans will survive as a loose organization in the European Union with a common market but not with integrated institutions. I don't believe that uh, in the Middle East there will be real, I mean, progress to modernization of the region only based on military power and might. And I don't believe that the coalition of the willing is the fitting structure in the 21st century and say it also not only to governments but uh, to many groups in the anti-globalization movement. I think the WTO, a modernized WTO, a more greener WTO, a more social WTO is a need, is a must in a globalized world. If you have bilateral trade agreements, it's fine for the rich and the powerful. But what happens with the poor? So from my view, we are condemned to cooperation. And therefore, it's also a bad message that we failed with the reform of the UN system. There we are. The European decided no about the Constitution. The American administration decided yes to go into Iraq and both together we failed to reform the UN. This is the reality. So we have to move forward. A second, how you call it, unlauf. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> huh? A second effort, uh, a second try. A second try. I think this is the serious challenge. Now, thank you very much for listening to me. I could go on and on, <laughs> but I'm more interested now in Q&As. And uh, thank you very much uh, for uh, such a warm welcome and uh, <laughs> that you listen to me.